Dylan, everything good? Okay, we'll start now. Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinn and I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H and on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce to you Elizabeth Wright. She's a professor in the Department of Biochemistry. She's going to be talking with us about cryo-electron cryo microscopy. Elizabeth, I get to ask you the five questions. Where were you born? Uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina. And where'd you go to high school? So I was split. I went to an American international school in Israel and then uh, Shaw High School in Columbus, Georgia. And in uh, Israel, what city was that in? Uh, so that was in uh, Kafar Shmiryahu. I've been to Israel just once and I don't know where that is. <laughs> it's on the coast, uh, so it's... Very Just good. a little bit up from Tel Aviv. Okay, thank you. And then where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? Yeah, so I did my uh, undergrad at Columbus State University in Columbus, Georgia, and uh, I have BS in uh, biology and chemistry. And then where'd you go for your advanced degrees and what did you study? So uh, I did my graduate work at Emory in Atlanta and also in chemistry, and then I did a postdoc at Caltech uh, out in Pasadena, California, in structural biology. And from there, well, I went to Emory University for first faculty position, and then I transplanted up here to Wisconsin in 2018. Very good. Delighted to have you here. I'm looking forward to your talk. It's an amazing concept. Um, I got to run an electron microscope for four and a half seconds in 1979, and uh, things have changed a little bit since then. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Wright to Wednesday Night Lab. Great, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom, uh, thanks, Tom for uh, the invitation and uh, continuing to uh, ask me to come and give a lecture. Uh, so he's been asking me for about four years, and I felt like before until we had the microscopes here at, at UW, it was like too premature uh, to, to be able to speak and show you some of the stuff we do here. And also thank you, Dylan, in the back for uh, the sound. Um, so I'm a professor in biochemistry here, uh, and we've been here almost five years, and so I will tell you a little bit about what we do with cryo-electron microscopy and why it is so cool uh, for studying uh, all kinds of biological and chemical systems. And so one of the fundamental things that we have to think of when we think of uh, imaging in, in all states uh, is physics. So we are actually, I, I guess I'm classified as a biophysicist, but it all, we also consider uh, astrophysicists. And so this is, uh, if I can have my cursor back, it's not showing, but so this is a kind of a, a continuum of what we can see in, in physics space. So we can go all the way from the atomic resolution scale using cryo-electron microscopy, where we can see the actual building blocks that are making up proteins, uh, nucleic acids that form all of the, the macromolecular uh, organelle systems in our body. I'm sorry, Tom, I can't get the cursor back, so I'm gonna have to use the pointer. Uh, so this is an extremely powerful tool uh, but then we can also think of what we can resolve with the human eye. So just at this limit of detection at about 0.1 millimeters, we can see, we can actually see a human hair. And so you can look at your head and you can see one. Uh, and then we can go all the way out into the universe and look at these amazing uh, astrological features. Uh, and so just like a little pinprint in, in space, you can actually just make out the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, but of course, we have these amazing telescopes that allow us to, to see this in uh, uh, remarkable detail. And so this is where we live in this amazing space in 2023 is we have this whole spectrum of imaging that we can do from the atomic level scale to the far reaches of the universe. And so I always think of us as explorers, uh, always moving through this space. Uh, and so if we're narrowing down into the, the subdiscipline that I'm in, in structural biology, we have a whole range of other tools that we use 
that allow us to then think about seeing the very minute details of, as I said, a protein, uh, nucleic acid, lipid, uh, but then we can get a little bit bigger and look at viruses, bacteria, uh, human cells, and then we can begin to look at tissues. And so depending on what technique we're using, we can have really amazing context, so we can look at a whole cell by fluorescence light microscopy. We cannot do that if we're thinking about using X-ray crystallography, because we basically break open that cell, purify proteins or nucleic acids that we're interested in, and then uh, collect a fraction data. And so those are two ends of the spectrum. But cryo-EM kind of sits in this special place where it's bridging between all these really hardcore structural biology disciplines and allowing us to see things uh, or solve structures at atomic detail, uh, then uh, being able to visualize them all the way up to cells and tissue level. And so today I'm going to kind of show you a whole range of different structures that you can see and, and visualize and study in biological space. So hold on to your chairs and, and enjoy the ride. Um, so why do we do biological transmission electron microscopy? So transmission electron microscopy actually began in about 1930s with Ernest Ruska, who engineered the first transmission electron microscope. And so the, re the rationale behind this was light microscopes at the time did not have enough resolution to really see the fine features in cells and things. And so they developed uh, these microscopes at the, that time. But what is our goal of doing biological EM? As we know, our bodies and any cell that we're looking at is made up of, what, 80%-ish water. And so how do we image these in the vacuum of an electron microscope in their most native state? Classically, people fix them, say with glutaraldehyde or put heavy metal stains, but by cryo-EM, what we're doing is we want to visualize these in their native hydrated state so that we can resolve the individual building blocks, these amino acids, these lipids, the proteins that make up every organelle in, in our system. And so these, uh, by using electron microscopy and cryo-EM, we can actually determine the ultrastructure at very high resolution of these objects. But I always think of the imaging we're doing uh, as that we're the explorers, as I mentioned before, uh, and that we just love to look at things. Because if we look at something really deeply, then we can think about what it means. And so these microscopes allow us to do this. So what are the, the benefits of cryo-EM? The major one that I mentioned is that we can retain specimen hydration. And I'll go through the process of how we prepare these samples. As I mentioned, we're imaging in a vacuum. So typically, if you put something hydrated in a vacuum, it's going to decompress. You're going to lose all the liquids, and, and you won't be hydrated anymore. So we've found me methods to retain that uh, with the preservation tools that we use. When we image things in the electron microscope, especially biological materials, there's also beam uh, damage that uh, they encounter. And so by preserving them in this frozen hydrated state, we can also reduce this beam damage. Again, because we're not introducing any chemical fixation, heavy, stain, heavy metal stains, or any other things that could potentially introduce artifact, we're really resolving these proteins or other structures that we're interested in at a atomic or near atomic resolution. And these instruments now are ridiculously fast. So we could actually solve a structure at atomic level resolution within the span of a couple of days. So here I'm highlighting just a few areas that we use uh, cryo-EM for. So vaccine and drug design. And, uh, I know, uh, I think it was last year, Rob Kirschdorfer talked, and he talked about coronavirus uh, within the Wednesday night at the lab. And so this is the spike protein that is uh, arrayed on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus particle. And so this was the, the first structure of this that was uh, um, solved by Jason McClellan's lab, lab at uh, UT Austin. And so this structure allowed all of the vaccine development and drug design to be pioneered uh, to help us uh, combat the pandemic. We can also think of using cryo-EM for other neurodegenerative or, or other disease states. And so we use it heavily in neuroscience. 
And so these are amyloid fibrils, and so we can understand the twist of these fibrils at very high resolution and see how they're developing plaques in the human brain. And lastly, we can just begin to explore the complexity of cell biology and uh, all the intricate uh, organelles, uh, macromolecules that are in that space and how maybe if we perturb them, infect them with a virus or, or other uh, particle, how that ultrastructure changes. So again, these samples are in their native state. We're not introducing any artifact. Uh, in my original slide, I had said X-ray crystallography is one of the highest resolution structural techniques that's used. And so the challenge there is you have to crystallize your object of interest. In cryo-EM space, we are imaging things in their native macromolecular context as you would see them in a cell or a virus. Uh, samples can be suspended in a variety of different solutions, so we can purify them out and have them in a buffer or we're imaging cells in physiologi under physiological conditions. Uh, so it's just a, anything that we could go and take a drop of water out of Lake Mendota, freeze it on a grid, and then see all the organisms that are present in, in the lake. And so that's something I think uh, we'll do as a field trip in the lab pretty soon now that the lake's uh, unfrozen. Um, and so one of the benefits of using cryo-EM is we also can resolve multiple conformational states of these objects that we're interested in. If we think of, like, for example, a structure known as the ribosome inside of cell, it's working just like we work, and so it's sitting there moving around and doing its job in the cell, and there's thousands of them all moving and doing different things, and so we can resolve all these different conformational states uh, using cryo-EM versus statically holding them in one particular state. Uh, my favorite technology that we use in my lab is cryo-electron tomography. And so this allows us to really look at really the unique, what I term the weirdos, uh, whole bacterial cells, mammalian cells, all kinds of envelope viruses, and really complex specimens to understand their intricate details. And then with lastly, we can correlate anything we do in cryo-EM space and cryo-electron tomography with other structural biology techniques one of our favorites to do is light microscopy because we can fluorescently label objects, image them by fluorescence microscopy, and then go to high resolution in the electron microscope. So microscopes through the ages. Uh, so this is uh, showing you the progression of microscopes since the 1600s. So this is the original Leeuwenhoek microscope. So he was in, uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, and so he built this little microscope where basically on this pin here, you put a droplet of, of a solution, so water, uh, in this case from a lake, uh, or one of the canals that, that are around in the Netherlands. And then on the other side, he has a very finely polished piece of glass, and so that was his lens. And so he would sit there, and you can you know rotate the stage up so that then you can resolve these objects. And so this was where he saw the first bacteria by using the Leeuwenhoek microscope. And you can actually, there's a, um, uh, a museum in the Netherlands where you can order one and it'll, you can actually have it and use it uh, in, in your daily life. Uh, of course, we all have used these light microscopes uh, when we were in high school biology class and also here at UW, just looking at you know, onion cells and other types of tissue. Uh, and then this is one of the microscopes now that we have at uh, UW. And so I kind of attempted to show the scale of these. So this is 12 feet tall, literally, and then you know, 18 inches versus four inches. So microscopes today are, are massive instruments uh, and it's a requirement of the physics behind how uh, the electron microscope works. And so if you're really interested in cryo-EM and what we're doing here at UW and other groups that we work with all around the country, this is our, our website here, so cryoem.wisc.edu. Uh, please uh, you know, visit us at any time. Uh, this is uh, Bucky Badger, of course, so we fib milled Bucky, so we're using a kind of a uh, as Tom said, kind of a lithography type technique. We milled Bucky Badger into a silicon wafer. Uh, so he is proudly represented on our website. And these are some other objects that we've imaged that I'll highlight throughout the rest of my talk. Oops. 
So we are really close to where we're sitting in this auditorium today. So Henry Mall is right here. And then uh, all of these microscopes and myself, we're all present in the biochemistry uh, department. And so we actually have space in all three of the buildings. So the historic building here, uh, the building behind it, the BSB building, and the biochemistry laboratories. And so this is an array of all the microscopes that we have here at UW, the Creos that I just showed you, uh, a fluorescent light microscope, uh, a simpler microscope that we use for screening. So please come and take a look. This year we won't be part of the science explorations because we're holding another workshop at kind of the same time, but we will be on the agenda for next year. So if you come and, and are interested, uh, we're, we're happy to, to give you a tour. So as I mentioned, we arrived uh, in Madison in the summer of 2018. There were no microscopes on campus. We were ordering them, and we had to do massive renovations of space. As I said, these microscopes are 12 feet tall, so they take up basically one of these microscopes with all of its friends that keep it running, fills this whole auditorium uh, in just this room, so the creos that you see here. And so we renovated many, many buildings in the space. Reynolds Transfer held the microscopes in storage for us for a while while we were renovating the space with a number of uh, engineering and architectural firms. Uh, and then right after the pandemic, because you can see that date there, the microscope was finally built and so we could start collecting data. And so just to give you an idea of what this initial installation of the microscope looks like, uh, these are the guys from Reynolds. Uh, and so we have this anti-vibration platform here. And so then they're basically going to crane over this three to 4,000 pound microscope onto that platform, which is about 18 inches off the floor. And so there they have just about done it. And this happened all in the eight hours on this particular day. So literally two weeks before campus shut down, we were installing the microscope. Uh, very happy. Um, and uh, so, yeah, th this is a real <laughs> intricate process of getting a microscope installed. That was the first phase of just getting it on the platform. And then it took about two months to get it up and running uh, to peak performance. And so with an electron microscope, we can uh, operate in two uh, basic pipelines, imaging mode, which I'm showing here. So this is very much like you would have in a light microscope. So we have the electron beam here. We run through a series of lenses, and then we're acquiring an image here. And so we have an aperture placed in what we term the back focal plane of the objective lens. The sample will be in this uh, specimen plane here. And so this allows us, by having the, the displacement, the lenses, and then this uh, aperture at the back focal plane, it allows us to set uh, these crossover points so that we can actually have an image collected uh, in this final plane. And so these are some examples of some objects that we've collected on this microscope. So this is a small protein sample. This is a slice through a reconstruction of a bacterial cell. And then these are neurons that we've cultured on a grid. And so we can do tons of work in imaging space, but we can also transition to what we term diffraction mode. And so in this case, we've shifted and have an aperture placed at the imaging plane of the microscope. So then it provides us with a diffraction pattern of an object of interest. Now this means that that object actually has to be crystalline. It can't be amorphous in structure because it would just be blobs. You would not have a diffraction pattern uh, generated. And so this is a, a protein known as lysozyme. And then Jay and, and Matt uh, collected diffraction data on that. And so you can see these little points of light, much like uh, the structure of uh, the DNA uh, that was collected with uh, X-ray crystallography, we can see these points that indicate the structure of that particular protein. And so this, will hi this highlights the three major modes of data collection that we use this, in this microscope for cryo-EM imaging. From left to right, we have single particle analysis, electron tomography, and electron crystallography, or microelectron diffraction. So in single particle analysis approaches, what we have are objects where it's thousands of equivalent objects. In this case, 
we're looking at a particular virus that we're interested in in the lab. And so each one of these viruses, its core structure, the capsid that encapsidates the, the genome of this particular virus, is all identical. And so that's what we're seeing out here, is the identical features of these viruses. And so through a process of taking thousands upon thousands of images and then extracting each one of these viruses, we can average them together to then generate a higher resolution, higher information structure. And so that's what we're showing you here. This is about 5,000 particles averaged to generate a higher resolution structure of these viruses. And so white is density in this case. And so you can see here the capsid lattice of these viruses. When we go back into the interior, it's kind of more fuzzy. And that's the genome that's within these particular viruses. And so because it's uh, more heterogeneous in its structure in this space, it's fuzzier. And so we would have to do a different process of computational approach to uh, solve that to higher resolution. I mentioned electron tomography. So this is one of my, my favorite techniques. We use this a lot in my lab. And so these are where we're looking at uniquely shaped objects. And so what we're seeing here are HIV particles that we've dispersed on this, this EM grid. And so in this case, what we do is what we collect is called a tilt series. And so has anyone here had a CT scan? Yes. Uh, okay, so if you recall those days of having a CT or an MRI scan, you're laying down the scanner, and then the scanner is revolving around you. Thank goodness you're not having to be tilted in the scanner, right? Because that would be problematic. So the scanner's revolving around you and is collecting 360 degrees of information. And so then they use a program, uh, an algorithm to then back project to generate the 3D structure of you. So they can see, did, do you have an ACL tear? Did you tear your rotator cuff? You know, do you have something else going on? And so you can think of this as a CT scan inside the microscope. But I just showed you how huge those microscopes are. We are not going to be able to physically tilt them around the specimen. So in this case, we actually tilt the specimen. And so here, we've tilted the specimen plus minus 70 degrees. And at particular degree increments, we take a picture. And so we take, you know, uh, anywhere from 30 to 70 images through this tilt series. And then we use that similar reconstruction algorithm like you use in a CT scan to then generate the 3D volume of these viruses. And so I targeted these two viruses here. Now I can actually show my cursor. So these two viruses up here are now displaying down here. And so this really shows the power of electron tomography. So the upper virus is the immature form of HIV. So HIV goes through once it's budded and released from, from the cell that it's been replicated in. Um, it assembles and it's released and there's the timing event of when a protease uh, comes in and, cha and clips the structural proteins apart in this virus. So you can see it has this beautiful lattice. It's all really nicely arranged in there, packed with all the information it needs to then be able to do its job next to then transition to the mature form of the virus. And so many of you have probably seen the cartoon structure of HIV, where it has this conical core, and then it's surrounded by this envelope. And so you can see that in the 3D structure here. And so this really shows the power of tomography, where you can look at things where we think, hey, they all have the same components, they should all look the same, but really they're very different from one another, just like people. We all have a heart, brain, lungs, but they're slightly in different positions. We are also scaled slightly differently. We're not all six feet tall, unfortunately. Um, so this is the power of, of tomography. Now, as I mentioned, we also have electron crystallography or microelectron diffraction. So let's say uh, you would like to crystallize your sample. You can still do electron diffraction inside the electron microscope, as I showed you in the slide ago. So we have the lysozyme, the diffraction pattern, and then we can build an atomic level structure of that object of interest. But how do we get there? And so I've shown you this huge microscope and we're looking at itty bitty things within this microscope. How, how do we get them, introduce them into the microscope? 
Uh, and so this is where we use EM grids. So here is one EM grid. There's, we're showing the, the front side and the back side. This is a copper grid. Uh, we've applied a carbon film on top of it. And so these grids are about the size of a pencil eraser, if you're looking face down. They're three millimeters in diameter. And so on this EM grid, uh, it has a mesh pattern. And then we've applied that carbon film on it. In this case, like the movie is showing, that carbon film is perforated. Because what we want to do is disperse our liquid inside those holes, i.e. the perforations, so that then we don't have any contrast except for the object of interest. Uh, because if the carbon film is behind it, it's going to have contrast on its own, and then it's harder for us to resolve our, our object. You can think of it like putting, uh, if you have a piece of saran wrap that is uh, colored blue, and you put that over your face, uh, it's going to be harder for someone to see you through it because of that color versus a clear piece of, of saran wrap. In order to prepare these samples, so I've shown you the, the small grids that we put them on, but then we have these other tools that allows us to freeze these samples. So all the imaging we do is actually at liquid nitrogen temperature in these microscopes. So that's at minus 186 degrees Celsius. It is insanely cold, and you will be burned by liquid nitrogen. Uh, my fingertips uh, can tell the tale. Uh, so we have these tools that we freeze these samples on. So we take those EM grids that I showed you, and then we put them in these devices so that we can freeze them. This is going from the old school method where we have a manual plunge freezing system to very automated and high tech systems. So the ideal is to have these more automated systems that we are very reproducible. So every sample that you're making will be identical to the last. I hate to say it, even with using these vitrification robots, they're not always identical. Uh, so you make lots of samples and still are looking for the best ones. And so what does this look like in practice? So these are plunge freezing systems. We basically use gravity to then drop into our cryogen. Uh, we also call them guillotines, which I don't know, that may be a non-ideal term. So the temperature we're freezing at is actually minus 183 degrees Celsius. And this is due to the cryogen that we're using inside of the double doer system. I still can't show my cursor. Um, and so we have this rod, we have a very small tweezer on here, and then we have our EM grid. And so at this EM grid, where you saw it in the movie, we apply our solution of cells, proteins, nucleic acids. It's just domed there per perfectly on that grid. And then we take filter papers, and then we blot it to near dryness. So then we're just going to have a few hundred nanometers of liquid on that grid. And then once that's prepared, we plunge it, we just let it go, uh, and into the cryogen. Mm -hmm. So we have a double doer system where we have liquid nitrogen in the outside, and then in the interior we have condensed ethane gas. Classically, it's ethane that we're using, and so you can condense it into a liquid. If it gets too cold, it'll form a solid, and so that's not ideal. Um, and so you've got the ethane, we use liquid ethane because it has a faster freezing rate than liquid nitrogen. Once the sample's frozen, then we store it in liquid nitrogen forever. I've had grids that I made in 2008. We could look at them in the microscope today and they would look as good as they did X number of years ago. Uh, and so this is what the grids look like. So at a low magnification view, you can see the ice on the grid. You can't see your protein of interest yet. Then we can get to this kind of level of view of a hole. Uh, a grid square, and then we can look at one of these perforated holes and see that pro those proteins arrayed beautifully within that ice layer. And so what we're really looking for is what we term vitreous or glass-like ice. So this is ice where there's no crystallinity in it. It's just pure what we term also amorphous ice. Uh, because if it had crystals in it, what those crystals would do is they would negatively impact the protein, the cell, or the, the lipids that we're in, uh, um, interested in looking at and introduce artifacts. And so those structures would be void and, and they would be meaningless to us. So I'll just highlight the single particle cryo-EM workflow. I'll talk about three, a few different workflows today. So once again, we have the grid, we've applied the sample to it, 
we freeze it, we throw it into the microscope, and then we take a ton of images, and then we use huge amounts of computational power to then generate these 3D structures that we're interested in. So that's really the snapshot view of this, and so I'll walk through this for a particular project that we're interested in. So Dan is a postdoc in the lab. He's a native Wisconsinite, uh, just up from Black Earth. And so he's really interested in studying bacteria and how they function, how they uh, generate, how they reproduce, how different ways the chromosome or the genomic material is dispersed within the cells during regular state uh, replication cycles or if it's under stress um, or during the process of cell division. And so as we know, all living organisms contain some sort of genomic material, either DNA or RNA, so bacteria contain DNA. Uh, and so what's really interesting about the bacterial genome, unlike ours, so in ours, our genome is contained in the nucleo nucleus, right? This is a membrane-bound structure within our cells. In bacteria, there's no membrane-bound structure where the genome is encapsulated, if you will. And so it's just kind of packed there in different spaces and it's free to move around and disperse depending on what's happening in the cell. But it does need some protective factors that help it out. Like if the cell is under st undergoing stress, maybe we've introduced an antibiotic to it or it's in a particular stage of its growth cycle. So bacteria and all other organisms have developed proteins that protect the genome at different states. And so Dan's really interested in looking at this particular protein called DPS, so DNA protection during starvation protein. Uh, and so it's, it's present at particular stress phases. It binds to the genomic material and it can at certain cases, and it's really cool to see it inside of a cell, it actually can form a co-crystalline array. And so I'm not showing you an image of one of those arrays today. Um, and so this is really important to protect these cells uh, during the process of their life cycle so they can continue to, to grow and flourish. And so DPS is a monomer, but it forms a dodecamer. And so that's what we're seeing here on this uh, right-hand side is the crystal structure of DPS. And in this rhodobacter cell, uh, the, the segmentation that's in orange that, that Dan produced is actually the genomic material within the cell. And so you can see it's dispersed. The cell is about to divide. You can see the division point here. And, you know, in a few minutes, the cell would have divided. So it's separating out its, uh, the genomic material to have the mother cell and then the daughter cell. And then this was some data we collected a long time ago where you can actually see there was a ribbon running across once we get to that plane again, and so we believe in this case that was the genome that had formed this, this helical uh, structure in this particular cell. And so what can we learn about the structure of DPS? And so this is a single particle cryo-EM project at this point in time. And so this is where Dan, uh, Brian, and Matt have been working together to collect a ton of data and process this data to then generate a really high resolution structure of this particular protein. So Dan has been working in the lab to purify it from E. coli uh, and then find the optimal conditions that where it's not degraded and we can collect uh, images like this on the left-hand side. And so as I mentioned, we go through this process of averaging structures together to generate the high resolution structure. And so what we do with an image like this and thousands of its uh, equal images is we extract out the individual DPS proteins. So thousands, well actually in this case, I think our particle set was about two million particles. Uh, so they carefully extracted out all these particles uh, from these images and then we can classify them. And so what does 2D classification mean? So these are all projection images. So we're not seeing yet the full, th full 3D structure of these objects. And at each each one of these objects may or may not be equivalent to the object next to it in this image. And so we go through rounds of classification to then sort them into the classes. So some will be identical in their 3D structure and 2D projection structure at this point, where others might be slightly tilted or even more tilted. And so that's what these classes are showing us is how we've collected all of these uh, proteins 
in particular structural conformations. And so we try and fill each 360 degree view in the 2D class state before we move on to degenerating a 3D structure. Otherwise, we will have a non-ideal uh, structure resulting. So here is the 3D structure of DPS that we generated from uh, the cryo-EM data that Dan and uh, Brian and, and Matt collected. And then here we can take the crystal structure and fit it into that map and see what's different, what's not. We can look at the different amino acids that are present. And then our next case is Dan's going to take this information and then we're going to go into the cell to the, and see how DPS is actually interacting with the genome when it's forming these co-crystal structures. Whoops. So as I mentioned, cryo-ET, I highlighted the workflow there, looking at pleomorphic samples. Our nominal resolution is one to five nanometers. Again, collecting a, ser a tilt series, and then we use this weighted back projection to generate the 3D volume. So the sample I'm gonna, example I'm gonna show you is uh, looking at neurons. So here's a cartoon of a neuron where we have the cell body, the axon, the, the dendrites present. Joe is a student in the lab, and so he's culturing neurons. Uh, in this case, these were mouse cortical neurons on, on the EM grid. Uh, and then we follow that over time to a particular time point. And then we plunge freeze the sample. And so then we can see those neurites and neurons as they've extended over the grid. And then we can collect tomography data. So this is through one of those neurites so that we're seeing extended on the grid. Uh, and we can see all the features within this portion of the cell. This is not the entire cell because neurons are huge, you know, uh, many, many microns uh, in length. Then we can generate a 3D reconstruction of that particular neuron uh, segment, so neurite. Now you're able to resolve really in 3D volume space all the detail within that portion of the cell. And so there are particular structures such as uh, microtubules, so this is the cytoskeleton that traffics different materials in the cell, gives it shape maybe. Uh, we have a mitochondria that comes into play, so as we know the powerhouse of the cell is in that particular region, but they're dispersed in many different places. We have different vesicles and of course the cell membrane. And so this is exciting for me to see, but then I also think, well, how do we make it more accessible for everyone else who's not, you know, interested in, as interested in neurons as I am? And so this is where we can uh, animate them, or we render them. And so this is where uh, many times we think of ourselves as Pixar animators in the lab, because now we're taking that 3D structural data and then targeting through rendering techniques, showing you where the microtubules are where that mitochondria is in the cell. And so then we can make movies of this to show it in 3D space. So one of the samples that we're interested in studying because we're very interested in infectious disease are respiratory viruses. Well, respiratory syncytial virus and measles virus. And so I'm not gonna go into exhaustive detail here. I just wanna give you highlights about the biology, but these are RNA viruses the viruses bud from the host cell, so we term them as enveloped viruses because they are budding from the lipid envelope of our particular cells. And our structural studies have really focused on the glycoproteins and uh, the nucleocapsid and matrix protein within these viruses. And so this is what a measles virus looks like, and then this is what a respiratory syncytial virus looks like through tomography. And so here's a cartoon. Uh, respiratory syncytial virus is a, a pathogen to humans. Uh, it's an RNA virus. It really has a substantial impact on the pediatric po population. Many of our children before the age of two will have been infected by RSV. Uh, and so there's no vaccine against RSV yet, although there's several in late stage clinical trials. And so there will be one soon. I think Pfizer has one that's just soon to come to market. Um, Bronchiolitis makes our children really sick, but since there's really, right now, there's only a monoclonal uh, therapeutic, they'll only give those to really immunocompromised children. So they'll tell you, well, 
treat your child like they have the flu, lots of fluids, rest, et cetera, unless you have immunocompromised. So it's really exciting that we'll have a vaccine soon that can then you know, help the rest of the population. Um, a cartoon structure of RSV, as I mentioned, it's an enveloped virus. So we have glycoproteins on the surface, much like SARS-CoV-2 has glycoproteins on the surface, RSV does as well. So this allows it to interact with receptors on our host cell to then be able to infect uh, the next candidate. Uh, so we have the lipid envelope, uh, matrix protein underlying that, another protein we termed M21, and then this snake-like guy is the ribonuclear protein that encases the RNA genome of these particular viruses. So that's a cartoon, it's exciting, but what do these virus particles really look like? And so this is some work that we did while we were still at Emory, is trying to understand what does an infectious RSV particle look like? And at this point in time, we were purifying viruses, and I would say for envelope viruses such as HIV, measles virus, RSV, flu, this is probably not the ideal way to, to, to go. Uh, because you see all these different morphologies. And so then you're left wondering, and all the virologists around us, as we were beating our heads against the wall doing cryo-EM structure work, uh, were saying, well, which one's the infectious one? You know, so much of the literature says it's a, it's a filamentous virus. And I'm like, well, we have these other one, these rogues gallery of these different viruses. And so this uh, allowed us to think differently about how we prepare samples that I'm not going to go into to detail here, but instead of purifying viruses, we, we actually culture cells on grids, infect them with viruses, and then we watch the process of uh, virus replication, assembly, and then budded virus on the grid. And so that's what this looks like, where we have a cell, and then you see all the different viruses budding off of this cell, you know, during different phases of production. And what this really allowed us to determine in great detail is that RSV is, the infectious virus is filamentous. All of those rounded viruses or the oblong ones or uh, squarish ones are not infectious particles. Filamentous ones are it. Uh, we could go through and do additional segmentation so that then we can also see the different layers of the virus, so from the outside in, the glycoproteins, the lipid envelope, the matrix protein, the RNP, and then we can verify that each one of the different viruses in a particular cell type, they all have the same viral components and are forming these filamentous particles. So this was fantastic and really groundbreaking work and allowed us to think about working with other groups to understand uh, as they were generating vaccine candidates, what the different structural proteins and things were, but one of the things that we're really interested in studying in, in my group is how viruses assemble. And so what are these building blocks, the different structural proteins that come together to form these viruses? One of the ones that we're most interested in because it's basically the glue that holds the whole virus together is the matrix protein. And so these are just representative matrix proteins of related virus, so Ebola, RSV, Newcastle disease, and human metanumovirus. And so you can see in a coarse grain view, they all have the basic same structure in these crystal structures. But we don't know what that structure is in a native virus particle, because a crystal structure is really not going to show you what's happening in a cell or in a virus. And so this has teased us for a long time of what, it, what this structure is for RSV. So some prior work from uh, another group, Michael Rossman, and our group, we were able to resolve uh, for Newcastle disease virus as well as measles virus that the matrix protein forms these kind of square or checkerboard lattice uh, in the viruses. And you can see that the crystal structure, then we can fit it into these maps and it fits nicely to then show this array moving forward. Um, at this stage, and, and knowing this level of information, we could think about generating mutants or other things to then tease out and understand a little bit more about the structure. So what about RSV? And so this is where we really needed the power of the microscopes that were coming to, to UW. At the time we collected this particular data set, we collected it out in an organ because we were just about to get the one here. 
But this shows us the real beauty and power of these particular electron microscopes. So remember, for RSV, we knew there was a density at the layer of the matrix uh, protein, but we could not resolve its underlying structure. And so Brian collected this data, and then these are just snippets through different layers through these viruses. And so in this one, you can see one of the glycoproteins. They're the, kind of these little triangles on the surface. Then we can go to the layer of the matrix protein, and you can see that it's actually forming a lattice. And then this M21 protein, it's forming these kind of uh, rounded uh, objects. Now, with single particle analysis, I highlighted that we can average thousands of particles together to generate a high resolution structure. But it, then I also said in the same breath, the power of cryo-ET is that we can look at things where everything's unique. Yes, that is the power of it, but within cells or viruses, we can also have structures that are equivalent. So like the glycoproteins on the surface of RSV or measles virus or that matrix protein lattice or ribosomes inside of a cell. And so what we can do in, in cryo-EM space is a technique we call subtomogram averaging. And so this is where we cut out 3D volumes of these objects of interest and then average them together to generate a higher resolution, higher signal to noise structure. And this is what Brian has done. He's taken thousands of these little matrix protein nuggets and averaged them together, you know, these 3D volumes to generate this lattice. And so initially, you know, it was really coarse nanometer level resolution. So then we recollected data here, now that we had the microscopes here at UW, and you know, it was getting better. And so now we have this structure sitting with a subtomogram average, and this is really exceptional data, um, sitting at 4.6 angstrom resolution. Now remember, atomic level resolution is one to two angstrom level resolution. And we're typically getting that of isolated proteins, you know, smaller macromolecular complexes. So we're seeing close to atomic resolution of a lattice forming structure inside of a virus. That is a pleomorphic weirdo shaped virus. So this is really exciting to us to think about what this means, how it's causing the virus to assemble in a particular way, how the other structural proteins are engaging with it to then uh, form these infectious particles. So conveniently, we do have the crystal structure for RSV matrix protein. Brian can fit this into the, the electron density map with really, uh, in a very high uh, quality way, uh, so that we can understand the organization at near atomic level. So everything I've shown you was things that are as a whole but they're small, so just maybe a few hundred nanometers uh, in thickness. But if we think of a whole cell, uh, you know, if you think of an onion cell or um, anyone's heard of HeLa cells here in the audience, maybe. Uh, so I'm showing HeLa cells here. Uh, they're many, many micrometers in thickness. And so in a transmission electron microscope, the electron beam cannot penetrate that thickness. And so we have to think of ways, how do we make things thinner? So we have another microscope we can use, and this is the one I'm showing here, that has, it's called a focused ion beam, FIB, scanning electron microscope, SEM. And we operate it under liquid nitrogen temperatures, hence cryo. So it's a cryo FIB SEM. And so if we have these cells that are really, really thick, uh, and the electron beam and the TEM cannot penetrate it, what we can do is we can what we term mill windows into these cells. And so this cartoon illustration is showing what this, can, what this looks like. So you have the cell that's laying down on the grid. You're really interested in looking at the nucleus here, but the cell is going to be too thick. And so you mill it from two sides so that you're just making this little transparent window that you can then image through in the transmission electron microscope. So what does that look like in more cartoon space? So 
In the uh, FIPSIM, we have the scanning electron microscope going down this axis. We have the focused ion beam coming in at an orthogonal axis. We have the specimen at the bottom. We orient it to where we're deciding where we want to mill that window. And that's what we're showing here in these cartoons. And actual, this is actual data from the microscope. So we make a window here and a window here. And then basically we've destroyed all that material. We've ablated it away so it's no longer present. And then all we are left with is just this few hundred nanometer thick region. And then we've rotated it 90 degrees, and so you can see that little lamella. So this is really powerful so that we can really begin to understand the detail of the structure within a cell. And so when we combine that with electron tomography, this is the resulting information that we see. And so I, I captured this uh, cartoon version of a cell that we have seen in our textbooks from general biology. And so you can see, you know, the outer, this is an animal cell, of course. Um, so you can see the, the lipid membrane. You can see all the organelles inside, you know, mitochondria, the powerhouse. And so then when we generate the 3D structure, we can actually resolve to, you know, nanometer and maybe close to atomic level resolution all of the proteins, all of the lipids, all of the nucleic acids that are coming together to form these discrete organelles within a cell. And so we're gonna really change textbooks, you know, by, by generating vast, uh, you know, libraries of what different cells look like under different conditions, you know, native conditions, maybe we are infecting them with a virus, and so then we can see how all the architecture changes uh, at really, really high resolution. And so this is my last data slide. Uh, so cryo-EM is really essential for structural biology and cell biology research. You know, we love looking at just about anything in the microscope. Uh, we can determine their native 3D structure uh, you know, of intact cells, macromolecules, to atomic, to macromolecular nanometer level resolution. This workflow can be very fast, you know, real-time structural studies where you could put an object in and you're getting your data back almost instantaneously and generating a 3D structure. And of course, I'm biased. I just think cryo-EM is really cool. And so, you know, this is one protein complex we look at. This is a bacteria that has been infected with a bacteriophage, i.e. a virus to bacteria, and so that's what these little uh, magenta guys are. They burst open that cell. And then this is one of those fib-milled uh, lamella uh, that we can see through a particular HeLa cell, and then we can overlay fluorescence microscopy on it to then target regions of the cell for understanding uh, substructure. And so I, there are far too many people to, to thank, but I've highlighted, you know, I've bolded the names of the people whose work I highlighted today. So Jay, Brian, Joe, Dan, Juan, Matt, Kai, and Anil all generated uh, structural work for this talk. But we have really fantastic teams here at UW that, uh, you know, we love to work with students, uh, staff, postdocs, people off the street, they're interested in bringing pond water to us, we're happy to, to make grids and look at it in the microscope. We work with really fantastic folks from Thermo Fisher, and of course all of our funding sources. Um, and so even here in Madison, we get that beautiful glass-like ice on the lake, or glass-like surface on the lake. And so I took this image in 2018, I guess, uh, because I just love the reflective nature of, of water and ice. And you know, this is us here at UW, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, no, we could make, uh, so there's multiple processes that we can produce the ice, but what I was showing here was plunge freezing. And so um, we're cooling at low temperature, so minus 183 degrees Celsius roughly, 
And so at that temperature, when we freeze these thin layers of solution, we're gonna produce this vitreous ice, or glass-like ice. Now, if we brought the temperature up, say minus 150 degrees Celsius, at that range, we would start to transition to crystalline ice. And so it's really the combination of at low temperature, there's other techniques I could talk about of high pressure and different things that allow us to form this particular non-crystalline ice. The grid doesn't matter in this case. That's just our tool to be able to get it into the microscope so that we can actually image. And we have a question back here. Yep. So I wonder if you have a giant server farm like the DNA uh, lab has here and if you're using artificial intelligence. Oh, that's an excellent question. And so the answer is yes. We are constantly building our computational infrastructure. So there's a number of great uh, supercomputing groups or high throughput computing groups on campus uh, that we tap into, uh, so the CHTC, uh, but we also have uh, resources in the cryo-EM facility uh, for specific computation. So for neural network or AI, there are particular points in time that we use those approaches. Uh, one of them is when we are picking particles. So I mentioned that in some cases we have millions of particles that we're picking I really don't want to force my students and postdocs to pick all those, those objects. And so we train on a small set of images to know what an object looks like. And then we can feed that into the neural network to then pick all of those particles. So that's one example. Yeah, beautiful question. So, can you repeat uh, the question, please? Sorry, what? Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so the question was, why, when would we want to use NMR uh, or cryo-EM or any other structural technique, or when do we blend them together for solving a structure? Um, so that's a great one. Uh, so the power of NMR is it allows you to look at things that are dynamic. Uh, or, well, unless you're doing solid state anymore. But typically, uh, you're looking at things that are dynamic because they're in solution phase. And so, for example, you could look at something that's at low temperature, and then maybe you're heating it up. And so you're seeing its mobility and how things change. Uh, and, but you're also limited in size. Uh, so your, your small units, I, I can't remember the exact KD uh, range, but you're really looking at small components of an object of interest. So you would not put a whole virus today inside of an NMR tube uh, to, to study the different proteins within it. Um, whereas in cryo-EM space, we could take that whole virus and look at it. However, it is a snapshot in time. So once we freeze that sample, you're not getting any mobility or dynamic information anymore. And so that's where we can blend those two techniques together to be able to resolve things in different space. Maybe we're changing pH, you know, temperature, other components of a buffer for NMR. And then we could see what happens in the more flash frozen in time space in cryo-EM. I could make a specific comment. Uh, so for example, the structure of immature HIV, there's a particular protein, the capsid protein. And uh, that particular region had been solved, uh, or a subregion of it had been solved by NMR. Uh, and when we generated the 3D structure of this particular virus uh, many years ago, we were able to fit that structure into the EM density of the, the tomogram, uh, and it allowed us to understand the connectivity between different components. And so that was a really powerful way of, of merging them. Other questions? So I did my darndest to keep up with you because this is so much material. But I'm sitting here and thinking, so you got all these, what you assume are identical molecules and groupings, but they're in different orientations and because they were living, living cells, they were in different stages of development or splitting or whatever it is. How do you sort all that out? Because you, you're going to get different orientations, different slices through there. 
uh, how do you sort all that out? I mean, this is, I, I, I gather this is where the software probably does something. Uh, yeah, so I guess I will ask, are you thinking in tomography space or single particle space or both? Um, single particle space, I guess. Okay. But, but I mean, any one of them is going to have the same sort of problem. I would say it's a different, it's a slightly different challenge in tomography space. But um, <coughs> so I will use myself as an example, and I think I can get away from the podium now. So let's say it's me, you know, and I'm here, and I'm I'm on an EM grid, and I've been frozen in ice, and so there's thousands of me, right? And so you're going to take an image of me, and I'm see-through at this point in time, and so you can see all of me uh, in space. But then I rotate this way. And so I'm tumbling in space on this grid, like I showed you. All different, yes, I'm not going to tumble this way, but yes. And so um, each one of those images that you take, and so you have all of those molecules in all those different orientations, we can then classify them out. And so there's multiple algorithms that different people have developed over time that allow us to see the infinitely small changes to be able to allow us to say, okay, we have 300 that are this way, we have five that are this way, you know, we have one that's, you know, this way. Um, and so then we can classify them out using these algorithms. But now you have Elizabeth at two years of age, right? If you take the analogy uh, okay. further, and at 80 years of age? Yes, how, okay. How? Uh, so. If we're watching something really change, so yeah, there's the unique Liz at X age sitting here, but the Liz at two years old. Uh, so then we can classify even based on that level of heterogeneity. Uh, so we can have things that are very, very homogeneous and there's no structural difference. Uh, but then we can also subclassify based on, well, let's say there's you know 50 of me like this, but then there's 50 like this because I'm gonna hold uh, a Coke. Here. And that's just part of my activation level. And so then maybe there's 25 of me like this. And so then we can subclassify knowing that there's going to be Liz that's here standing at attention, and then the other ones that are here holding a Coke. So having many, many samples really helps out. Yes. And the assumption, I suppose, that they're identical, or at least there's no pollution in the Well, we can classify based on motion and different things that we see. Uh, so, well, they're not moving, they're static, you know, when they're in the ice, but we have seen, you know, you can resolve changes in conformation and then you just pick those particles and separate them. Thank you. Sure, here we go. Oh, there's more, so there's another one over here too. Okay. So maybe a, uh, so maybe a long-term or broader spectrum question. Oh, maybe a long-term or broader spectrum question, but do you uh, picture a point where you can image, let's say, a virus and zoom in, so to speak, on what particular amino acid is at that particular place in that virus? Or, um, you know, like what particular amino acid is at that binding site in that cell or in that wall or in that protein in that virus or along those lines? So do you mean in a single image or an average structure? Aver um, average structure, I'd say. Yes, absolutely, we can do that already today. Okay, yep. nice, that's cool. So uh, I'll go back to this slide. So um, the top structure here on the left side, um, I guess I'll use this red one. So this is this apoferritin protein. It's forming this large complex. They're highlighting this one single amino acid residue, and then they noticed at this particular region there was a substitution. And so this was, that structure is at 1.25 angstrom resolution, so they are able to resolve like all the waters, every atom within, within that complex. It's a very specialized one. We're not that, there for everything. But every day, there's another structure coming out where the field is just changing so fast. It's, it's really taking that, um, the image of the cell that you see in your high school textbook and allowing you to really like, 
you know, zoom in smaller and smaller, so to speak. Yeah. Thanks. Um, when you're uh, when you're taking all those photos for a single uh, particle analysis, are they taken from different angles usually? Uh, it depends. Uh, so a lot of times, well, it depends on the object that we're imaging. And so that little movie that I showed talked about uh, sometimes proteins will come to what we term the air-water interface. And so they'll be at that ice layer that then we freeze. And so if they're at that air-water interface, this can change their structure and then pr cause preferred orientation, which now we're getting into deep into the woods. Um, so perfect world, if you have your object suspended in this ice layer and they're tumbling in space, they're not touching the, the edges of the ice, you will get, ideally, all 360 degree views because they're just, you know, they're, they're like that, right? However, if you have objects that are then stuck to that la one of those layers, or maybe they're a Coke can shaped object and they're either gonna wanna sit like this or they're gonna wanna sit this way in the ice. That's what we term preferred orientation. And so when we collect the data for those single particle projects, we actually tilt it. So that then we can kind of, we're able to collect more images and more of those views to fill that 360 degree space. Okay, that was, um, that kind of led into my next thought. Um, so is there like a lot of noise when you're combining those, like blur? And is that what the purpose of the algorithm is, is to reduce that so you get more of a signal? Well, so that's another whole other topic uh, to go into. So um, in the old days, uh, and I've even collected data on film, we used to collect all our imaging data on film. And then we would process that film and you know, generate negatives and then you know, scan them and do all this. And so that was really painful. Uh, and then we had CCD cameras. Now everyone has a CCD camera on their phone. And so in the early days of CCD cameras on your phone, it was one singular image, right? That's it. Now you can collect an image in what we term a little movie, like a three second video, right? So then you can take all of those frames and say, Hey, I look happier in this one. This is the one I actually want to use. The detectors we have now today also acquire data in movie mode. And so, and this is something I did not talk about is, uh, but you really, I don't know, have you been talking to someone? Uh, so when samples are suspended in ice and the electron beam hits the ice, there's motion. And so with these direct electron detectors, because we can collect uh, data in movie mode, like frames, so th hundreds or you know, tens to hundreds of frames, we can actually computationally, there would be blur, right? Because now you've got the ice moving, your object is moving in the ice. Now we can computationally correct for that motion. And so one of the other faculty here on campus, Tim Grant, actually developed one of the main algorithms we use, Unblur, to, uh, to solve this problem. Uh, and so that's part one, that we've corrected for that. And so that's where we got what we term the resolution revolution in cryo-EM at about 2013, is because of these detectors and these algorithms that then we can combine to use in cryo-EM space. Um, Okay, so is, is it like a Fourier transform, kind of? Is that part of the math? It is, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. But there can also be, so when you talk about motion, so there's motion in the ice, but then there's also particles are doing different things. Like what the other gentleman asked, you know, is how you see things in different states, right? And how you classify them out. And so that's where the algorithms do allow you to pick particles based on if they're in different conformational states. Okay, cool, thank you. So I think this gentleman may still have a question. Yeah, it's, a, it's based upon the other discussions about, so um, 
I'm thinking. In I'm ter talking in ter th thinking in terms of the speed. Uh, temperature actually d d uh, limits the speed at which these particles are moving, and their geometry has to be changing too. I would suspect. I mean, the the fact is that the, that these proteins are curling or not cur uh, curling and uncurling, and they're supposed to interact with other molecules, and that it does so by changing its orientation and binding differently. I'm, I'm curious about the, the, the speed, basically, of what's going on there. They're not at the, they're not at a normal temperature, and so their speed of rotation and their speed of, of movement is going to be different in a cryo condition than it would be in a normal, no, at normal temperatures. Right, so uh, great question. So once we've frozen them, it's, it's a static system, and so there's no more activity happening, uh, except for what ice does at different temperatures. And so that's a whole other question. <laughs> uh, but you're not going to have your, your object of interest doing anything anymore, unless you gently unfroze it, maybe did some, had some other chemistry happen and then refroze it. But very few people do that, if ever. You can do time-resolved cryo-EM, but that's where you are freezing at different time points to capture an event, but then once it's frozen, it's, it's static. I've been trying to come up with an analogy that I can use um, f f with lifelong learners, young people, old people, people who are going, what's this mean? Um, and I'm thinking of three. One is the old school jacks. So you throw jacks across a table and they come to a stop and you take a picture of them. And if you take a picture of each of the, say, 10 or 12 jacks you have, can you then get a better idea of what the overall shape of a jack is based on which ones have the knob up and which ones have the knob down? Um, what if you took a bunch of like half inch hex nuts and scattered them? Almost all of them would be flat, but a few would be standing on one of the hex sides. Yep. And so then you could take pictures of those hundreds of nuts. A few of them would be standing up, but it would give you a better idea of what the three-dimensional view of the, that is. Um, and then I'm wondering about something irregular like cashews. If you took cashews and... <laughs> I know, it's time for some dinner. <laughs> Just wait till I get to Hershey Kisses, man. <laughs> um, are these analogies close to what, in, in other words, once you scatter the cashews, they're going to be slightly different shapes, slightly different sizes and stuff, but the, you would take those and try to analyze the tens or hundreds of pictures of what you would get. Is that close to what you're doing with some of the stuff that your one student was doing with the virus particle? Yeah, so with the... Uh, jacks and the hex nuts, that would be single particle cryo-EM because basically all of those would be near identical, right? Okay. Uh, whereas the cashews, I think cashews are each unique, and so then that would be more of a, a tomography style okay. project. So you take a CT scan of cashews to then understand what all cashews are like, and so you take CT scans of thousands of cashews. Uh, Whereas with the other ones, you would just, and, and then you would look at them as a population, like humans. You look at them as a population and think, well, okay, so, um, you know, everyone has, I'm trying to think of a feature that I don't suddenly go into crazy land. Um, That's all right. We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone has a nose, right? Hopefully. Uh, so, Voldemort called and would like yeah, to have well, a word. <laughs> He just has a different looking one. Uh, so we all have noses, but maybe, you know, it's slightly crooked. Maybe it's this way. You know, maybe it has, you know, more beak shaped. And so that's where tomography is really useful because it's allowing you to see the whole human, you know, and then these discrete differences. Whereas the single particle, like with the jacks and head nuts, hopefully all of those are the same. And that's where you collect all equivalent images and average them together. Okay, I, as a, one of the fun things about totally new, well, totally new stuff to me at least is trying to figure out 
how does this make sense to me, but also how can I help speed other people's understanding? And there's nothing worse than an analogy that sends them down the wrong alley, uh, unless you're. No, those were perfect. Okay. Good. Cashews are an interesting one. I'll have to think. Use that uh, one in the future. I'm sorry I fixed such a healthy food. I was thinking it's, you know, like M and M's, but too uniform. Any other questions? Yep. So I have two more, hopefully, really simple questions. <clears throat> so you freeze the sample and shoot the electron on that, mm -hmm. then. Wouldn't that electron beam, you know, raise the temperature of the sample? So, like, kind of defreeze the sample so you get junk out of it. So, <clears throat> is that a, is that something happen when you do the cryo TEM? And the second thing is, um, when you do the CT, you rotate the scanner like 360 degree, but I believe you cannot really do that with the TEM. So, like. Um, what kind of range of angle do you scan, or like, what is like the minimum number of you know pictures do you need to generate the three D version of whatever specimen? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Really fantastic questions. I'm being put through my paces tonight. Um, so, uh, does the electron beam damage the sample? One hundred percent. Yes. Uh, so. The first electron that it hits is breaking bonds. And so we typically think of it as a radiolytic damage. And so I almost wish I should show this movie of just, uh, so when we're collecting data, the first electron is damaging, and so it's a race against time of how many images we can collect. So if we're taking single particle cryo-EM, like of these, these virus particles here, we take you know, the one image, but it's also fractionated into frames, but we're still taking one image. And so within one of those images, we're using, and I know this is super nerdy, roughly 45 electrons per angstrom squared for that total image. Now remember, that's that one summed image, but it's also broken up into frames. So each one of those frames has a different dose within it. Maybe one for maybe the frames are divided into five electrons per angstrom squared, you know, or some other sub amount. And so what we can do is, you know, generate the 3D reconstruction like of this virus that we've colorized here, and then we can say, well, okay, we know there's going to be damage because the electron beam is damaging. We can see smearing in the image and stuff like that. And so then, because we've collected all these frames we can subcategorize and kind of what we polish, if you will, and pick a region of those frames that we're gonna use for the final reconstruction uh, so that we limit the amount of electron dose damage to the sample. Now that's easy to do in, in single particle space, less easy to do in tomography space because we're basically, we have to use all the dose we can because each image Remember, one image here is like 45 electrons per angstrom squared. Uh, one image here in the tilt series is maybe one to two electrons per angstrom squared. So we are using, for HIV in this case, a total dose for all of those images of 120 electrons per angstrom squared. And we know that final image, we're starting to really see destruction, you know. But we want to, we can't use the power of single particle cryo-EM to look at HIV or a whole cell or whatever, because one image won't tell us anything, or, you know, many of them. Um, and so uh, we're just racing against the clock in a way, or racing against the dose. Um, but we are trying to figure out different data collection schemes, you know, with the microscope so that then we can remove some of that damage. Maybe we can make the dose we're using smaller, you know, we're, we're doing the subtomogram averaging if we can cut out uh, object shapes that are, you know, identical. And so you raise the beautiful point about our total tilt range. And so 
Remember, the electron microscope is a column. So we put the sample in, and because of the, the sample geometry, it's the grid, it's in a holder, it can really only tilt, you know, plus minus 90 degrees. But once you get to 90 degrees, you're going to see the grid, right? So you're not going to get anything. So the maximum tilt we could ever get is maybe 80 degrees in both directions, plus minus 80. But really not on a cryo sample. This was plus minus 70 degrees when I took it. Now today, we're really only doing like plus minus 60 degrees because we're trying to reduce that, that dose damage from the electron beam that, that comes into play. Like with the software or I mean, with the improved algorithm or software? Like how do you, like how do you get the same, um, same quality of 3D image out of you know, less you know, scans? But it, well, part of it comes to these, these detectors we're using today. So this data was actually acquired on a really fancy, in 2006, uh, CCD camera. Uh, what we collect on today, like that image in the upper one, uh, or this one here, is one of the direct electron detectors. Um, and so they have a higher signal to noise ratio, other factors that give a much, much improved image, less noise, you know, and, and trash in the image. Plus, we have a couple of other tools on the microscope that allow us to remove uh, extraneous noise uh, in the final image, uh, and then computational algorithms that we use uh, to clean them up. Thank you. Yep. In uh, transmission electron microscopy, 45 years ago, we had stains, urinal, acetate, lead acetate, that type of thing. I haven't heard you say anything about that. Is that all out the window? No, no. Uh, we still use negative stain, uh, TEM. Uh, no, I mean for cryo EM. Oh, not for cryo. So all of this is unstained material. Uh, so this is really, you're seeing the phase contrast based on the macromolecules contained within those objects and no stain applied. Uh, but we still use these stains for helping us understand, have we purified our protein well enough? We can throw those on a grid, image yeah. it really quick in another microscope to see, oh, we need to do more biochemistry, or maybe we need to culture our cells in a different way. Um, so we still use it, just not in cryospace. It amazes me how much microscopy is in the buildings across the street, the biochemistry complex. When I came here as a graduate student in 1982 for plant pathology, I don't know that you had a microscope in the whole building. And we had one in plant pathology, and you weren't in a real department if you didn't have an electron, micro electron microscope. Um, but biochemistry is, is, like I said in my little missive last night, it astonishes me what imagery has done now for the folks in your department, the two departments, biochemical sciences and biochemistry, and I hope I'm getting it right, but it is amazing and astonishing. It, it is pretty fun. Uh, there's, you know, my favorite days are being on the microscope and seeing something for the first time uh, that nobody else has, has seen before. Those are, the, those are the best days. Great. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.